東京ライブ in b o s p i c o n e Hello, everyone. I would like to start our session. Now, I would like to introduce Dr. Hiro Aihara. He is now currently Associate Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School and Director of Endoscopy Tissue Resection Program in Division of Gastroenterology, Hepatology, and Endoscopy, Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, United States. Dr. Hiro Aihara received his medical degree from Tokyo GK Medical University in 1998. He has published more than 100 peer reviewed first and senior author articles, and he has been elected to essential roles in academic societies and also been invited to give lectures and. Serves as course director, moderator, and hands on faculty at prestigious national and international society meetings. Today,、uh, Dr. Hiro Aihara will present cutting edge technology in EFTR. Could you please help me welcome Dr. Hiro Aihara, please? Thank you very much,、uh, Professor Tajiri, for his kind、uh, introduction. Uh, I'd like to、uh, express my sincere gratitude to、uh, Professor Tajiri for uh, your uh, continuous mentorship for me. And also, I'd like to thank uh, Professor uh, Inoue for giving me this great opportunity to give this lecture today. So,、um, today、uh, I'm going to talk about the、uh, cutting edge technologies、uh, in the EFTR. Okay, so this is my、uh, COI. So, I'm going to start my、uh, lecture、uh, by showing some、uh, guidelines from ASGE. So, this was published in 2019 by、uh, ASGE Technology Committee,、uh, it, which describes the、uh, two indications of the、uh, uh, EFTR. So, the first indication is the mucosal lesions,、uh, including the benign lesions and the cancers that are not amenable to EMR or ESD due to extensive submucosal fibrosis. The other is,、uh, indication of EFTR is the submucosal lesions, which is the subepithelial lesions originating from or、uh, involving the muscularis propria, which is not amenable to EMR or ESD. So, currently, the EFTR endoscopic full thickness resection is subclassified into two categories, including non exposed EFTR、uh, and exposed EFTR. So, in the non exposed EFTR, first the GI wall is plicated in a full thickness fashion, and this is followed by a lesion resection. In the exposed EFTR, the first lesion resection is performed in a full thickness fashion using the ESD devices. And then the, basically, the GI lumen is exposed to the peritoneal cavity. So, this is why this is called、uh, exposed EFTR. And then, following this lesion resection, the defect is closed、uh, by using the endoscopic suturing device or endos endoclips and the suture loops. So, I'm going to show the,、uh, the device、uh, currently we use for the non exposed EFTR technique. So, this is、uh, called FTRD system developed by Obesco,、uh, which incorporates the、uh, 21 millimeter Obesco clip、uh, with the hot snare. So basically, this procedure is performed start with the uh, uh, full thickness、uh, plication by using the Obesco clip.、Uh, and this is followed by a、uh, full thickness resection using the hot snare. So I'm going to show some、uh, show a, a case video,、uh, which is the、uh, local recurrence of the high grade dysplasia、uh, seen in the sigmoid column.、Uh, following the marking、uh, with the、uh, marking dots, the, by using the Grasper, the target lesion is pulled into this、uh, system. And then, following、uh, subsequently, the、uh, Obesco clip was、uh, deployed, and then using the hot snare, this lesion was removed. As you can see here, the full thickness rejection、uh, defect is here,、uh, can be shown here. And then the Obesco clip has been、uh, completely closed this、uh, defect. 
So this is a study uh, from uh, uh, showing multi-center study, including 181 patients from nine centers. Uh, this study shows the uh, technical success uh, rate of 90%. However, the R0 rejection rate was 76.9%, uh, which is not ideal. So basically, uh, this the issue with the non-exposed EFTL technique is that the R0 rejection rate is limited by the size of the uh, this device, which is 20 millimeters. So basically, if the lesion is uh, larger than two centimeters, you are not going to be able to uh, remove this lesion in unblocked uh, fashion with the negative margins. So this study shows the uh, very low uh, R0 rejection rate of 60%. So I'm going to show some uh, case video, uh, which is uh, 2.5 centimeter uh, just in the gastric pandas with the exophytic uh, growth. So, which is, so this case is basically is not a good uh, candidate for the non-exposed EFTL technique uh, because of the size, uh, which is larger than two centimeter. Also, this has the exophytic uh, type of growth uh, gist. So this is uh, performed by uh, Dr. Stafros group. Um, so first of all, the uh, periphery, periphery of this Cyst was uh, incised in a full thickness fashion. And then the next step by using this uh, grasper, this uh, target lesion was pulled back into the uh, stomach and then passed to the other grasper uh, with the ultra swim scope. And then by using the hook knife, this lesion was completely removed in unblocked fashion. And then the specimen was retrieved. And then as you can see, the uh, uh, defect closure was started with the, uh, uh, the overstitch. However, in the middle of the procedure, the uh, inner side of the mucosal defect was very difficult to uh, access. So in this case, the structure with the uh, pulley method was used to pull the uh, uh, inner side to, towards the uh, endoscope. And then subsequently, by using the overstitch device, uh, this uh, defect closure uh, was performed, uh, and this is the final appearance of the uh, uh, sutured area. So, so basically, the interrupted uh, stitch was uh, used to close this defect. So um, this is the uh, study from China, uh, including over 500 uh, cases of EFTL. So this study showed very high uh, complete resection rate of 97.1%. And also the mean procedure time was around 50 minutes. So basically, uh, the technically uh, speaking, the uh, uh, techniques uh, difficulty in the EFTL is not that high compared to ESD because in the EFTL, we basically need to cut around this uh, target lesion. However, the study also showed the uh, very high uh, perforation rate. So there was a 16.4% uh, of the persistent perforation, which is the biggest issue with the exposed EFTL technique. So I'm going to show some uh, issues in uh, currently we have in the current uh, EFTL technique. So if you look at the uh, current design of the overstitch, so this is the earliest design of the uh, endoscopic suturing device, which was called Eagle Crow which was developed in 2005, which evolved into the overstitch in 2011. And then more recently, the overstitch uh, SX, which was developed for a single channel endoscope became available in 2018. So basically the uh, endoscopic suturing device allows us to do things that we wouldn't been able to uh, perform uh, otherwise with the endoscopic clips. You know, we, this uh, endoscopic suturing device also allows for some various types of the suturing patterns, including interrupted suture and the running suture and the figure of H suture and the pass string suture. So these are the biggest advantage of suturing devices. However, um, there are several uh, issues uh, currently we have in the suturing device. Uh, first of all, uh, we need to have to uh, multiple steps uh, just to apply uh, the one stitch as shown here. And also if you look at the uh, design of this uh, endoscopic suturing device, you can see that the uh, endos uh, there is a very precise uh, alignment uh, required for the endoscopic uh, suturing anchor and also the needle body. So if there's a misalignment between the two uh, 
to uh, instruments, uh, this will uh, result in the device malfunctions uh, during the surgery. So um, also, if you look at the uh, surgery, so in the, this is a video from the laparoscopic assisted colectomy. Always there is an assist from the assistant who holds the uh, tissue uh, to visualize the uh, uh, target layer for the uh, surgeons. And also there is a very good traction for the surgeons to be able to effectively dissect the target tissue. And also if you look at this video from uh, transanal endoscopic microsurgery, always the surgeon's uh, right hand is holding the uh, specimen. And so the, uh, he can uh, dissect the uh, target tissue very effectively. However, in the flexible endoscopic surgery, we do not have this type of uh, traction uh, during the flexible endoscopic surgical uh, treatments. So, and also this video uh, shows the uh, difference between the laparoscopic suturing where we uh, use the rigid uh, laparoscopic tools. Uh, and then this is the robotic suturing uh, by using the robotic technology. So you can appreciate that uh, how difficult it is to just to catch the uh, curved uh, needle by using this uh, rigid uh, non-articulating uh, devices to do a running stitch. However, if you look at the uh, right video, uh, you can appreciate that the, how smooth and precise it is by using the robotic technology uh, because these instruments has a multiple joints that allows for the triangulations of the uh, instruments. And also the uh, very precise maneuver can be performed by using these robotic technologies. So however, if you look at the design of the current flexible endoscopes, we only have this single channel therapeutic endoscope, which allows us to use only one instrument, which is not articulating. And also in terms of the maneuver of the scopes, we only have up and down, and also the left to right, and also the left and right toe. So, so basically we are performing the flexible endoscopic uh, surgery, so which has the same type of maneuver as a surgery, including a tissue incision, tissue dissection, and uh, tissue mobilization, and also the hemostasis, which is performed in the surgery. However, we only have this uh, single channel therapeutic endoscopes. Uh, we are forced to train ourselves uh, to somehow perform these uh, complex procedures, including ESD and EFTL uh, to safely and uh, securely perform these uh, procedures. So I'm going to show some uh, newest uh, technologies uh, currently we have for the flexible endoscopic surgeries. So currently in the United States, uh, there are several uh, companies that are working on the robotic technologies, uh, including Intuitive Surgical, uh, Medtronics, and the Valve Surgical, which was recently acquired by uh, Ethicon, and also the uh, Cambridge Medical Robotics. So these companies have developed multiple new uh, robotic surgical systems. So, however, these technologies are mainly for focusing on the uh, robotic uh, laparoscopic surgery. However, uh, recently a company from Texas uh, called Colbris MX has uh, developed a very new uh, flexible endoscopic su robotic surgery system, which is called ELS system. So this is the actual uh, flexible robotic system, which incorporates the uh, uh, flexible overture, uh, which is called Colbris score. Uh, so which allows the uh, use of the uh, two uh, robotic, fully robotical uh, instruments uh, in, inside it to this uh, over tube. And then this over tube and instruments are controlled by this uh, surgeon's console, which is equipped with the uh, master controller. So interestingly, the design of this master controller is the same uh, design as the other uh, robotic uh, surgical system. So um, this is the cross view of the flexible over tube. So basically this over tube has uh, three working channels. Two are for the uh, robotic, uh, robotic instruments, which has uh, four uh, joints, which allows for the uh, fully articulation and also the uh, uh, triangulation during the surgery. And then the third uh, working channel is for the robotic endoscope. So we also have some various types of, of the robotic instruments, including needle driver 
and the cautery knife and the curved scissors and so on. And also the biggest difference between the uh, robotic, uh, flexible robotic system and all, uh, between the flexible robotic system and the robotic surgery system is that the shaft is also flexible. And this allows the use of this device in the uh, flexible over tube. So I'm going to show the video of the uh, actual uh, motion of this uh, device. So on the left top video, you can see that the uh, mother scope, which is a scalable over tube, is controlled by this uh, master controller. And then on the left uh, bottom video, so by uh, stepping on this uh, foot pedal, uh, you can switch the uh, target uh, motion. So, so you can switch to the uh, daughter scope. So currently, this is uh, uh, maneuvered by the uh, master controller. And then this is the actual uh, movement of this uh, instrument. So uh, as you can see here, because this uh, instrument has four uh, joints, uh, this allows for the fully articulation and the triangulation, and there's no interaction between the two instruments. And then you can appreciate that uh, how precise it is to use these uh, flexible uh, instruments uh, in this system. So uh, this is a video uh, from the my visit to Discovery MS in Houston, Texas. And then this was the first time for me uh, to use this device, but this device was, uh, system was very user-friendly and, uh, and I do not have any uh, background as a robotic surgeon, but I was able to uh, move this uh, uh, object from the one peg to the other peg. And this was very smooth and very easy for me. So uh, currently, uh, this robotic system uh, has been approved for the clinical use in mainly in the South America, including Chile and Brazil. So we have, um, so they have uh, performed seven human clinical ESD cases in, in Chile, and also the 25 human clinical ESD cases in Brazil. Uh, in the country, our plan is to uh, do uh, go through the uh, application for the FDA in the United States. And then we are going to perform e a robotic ESD and EFTR and the bariatric treatment by using this flexible uh, robotic surgery system. In this video, you can see that uh, this left instrument is holding the uh, a target tissue and while the uh, right instrument is dissecting very nicely in the submucosal layer. And also this is a video uh, from the uh, robotic endoscopic suturing uh, by using this device. Uh, so you can see that the very smooth uh, maneuver of the, uh, uh, the uh, needle holder, and then there is no interruption between the uh, two instruments. And so this is uh, used for the closure, defect closure after the EST. However, I think this is, uh, has a potential to be used for the defect closure after the EFTR. So, um, so this is my uh, take home message. So we have to carefully uh, determine the uh, indications of the EFTL. So basically the non-exposed EFTL technique is safer than exposed EFTL. However, it is currently limited by the size of the device, which is a 21 millimeter. And for the exposed EFTL, we need to have a reliable secure closure of the peritoneal entrance site. So this is essential for the uh, for the uh, safe and effective uh, exposed EFTR technique. So finally, the novel robotic system would facilitate and safe and effective flexible endoscopic surgery. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much for your thought provoking instructional lecture. I would like to ask us a couple of questions. Uh, Hiro, do you consider that the current EFTR will spread among general gastroenterologists and endoscopists in the United States? Thank you for the great question. So uh, as I showed in the, uh, my uh, lecture, so basically the non-exposed ESTL technique is uh, considered to be much safer compared to the uh, non-exposed uh, EFTL. So I think in terms of the safety, uh, the non-exposed EFTL has the potential to be uh, spread uh, 
uh, used for the general by the general uh, GI surgeon, uh, GI, uh, GI uh, attendings. However, I think the uh, so basically the size is limited by the the target size of the region is limited by the size of the system. So uh, there's some limitations. However, the exposed EFTL has some risks uh, of the peritonitis, so it still has some uh, issues uh, with the uh, technique itself. Uh, next question from me. Uh, I'm very interested in the robotics, especially uh, Corobrix MX from Texas. If there are young uh, doctors who want to conduct ESD or EFTR in the future, should they be trained with uh, conventional flexible endoscope or with robotic endoscope from the beginning? From the beginning. Thank you very much. So this is also a great question. So, uh, so we, so basically for the ESD and also the robotic ESD, so we need to have a very different skill set. So for the conventional ESD, we need to have a like technique in the flexible endoscopy. However, in the uh, robotic ESD, we need to have a uh, have the uh, control on the bimanual uh, control of the robotic technology. So it's a very di different skill set. But uh, we conducted a study, prospective study, uh, enrolling by enrolling uh, five uh, young endoscopists who did not have any experience in conventional ESD and the robotic ESD too. However, there is a significant improvement in the number of resection rate and perforation rate and also the, uh, the uh, uh, procedure time in the robotic ESD. So basically, I think the, uh, there is a potential in the robotic ESD to uh, shorten the learning curve for the young endoscopist. So if the uh, efficacy and safety of the robotic ESD is proved in the future, like clinically proved, I think the uh, probably the young endoscopist should start their uh, training in the ESD with the robotic technology. Okay, thank you. My uh, final question is, what do you think about limitation of current robotic endoscope, limitation of robotics endoscope? Thank you very much. So, um, so basically the robotic flexible endoscopic ro robot system looks very promising. However, the issue is that, first of all, the issue is the, uh, uh, the cost. I think the uh, robotic system probably costs around uh, one million dollars, which is probably over like each open in in uh, in yen. So uh, I think that the biggest uh, issue, the cost, is uh, one of the issues. And also the in terms of the robotic technology, the current uh, over tube is only twenty to thirty centimeters, so which is not long enough to perform the ESD in the right sided column. Uh, so in the future, so currently it looks like if you want to in extend the length of the over tube, the tip control it becomes very uh, unstable. So that's their biggest issue in the robotic technology. So probably in the future, we might need to have some uh, over tube to uh, navigate the robot to the right-sided corner. But I, I think this is one of the uh, uh, goals we have. Okay, thank you. Our time has almost run out. I would like to thank uh, Professor Hiro Aihara for making this session a success. Thank you very much again. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Tajiri. Thank you very much. Bye.